This curved geometric figure that you see on the screen is called a cardioid and is present throughout nature. We find it in the diffraction patterns of liquids, in the propagation of seismic waves, in the propagation of sound waves, and in the propagation of electromagnetic waves. We also find it in magnetic fields and in solid structures like shells, flowers, and fruits, where the cardioid manifests itself as a natural design. This figure is therefore a geometric pattern, completely natural and not at all eccentric. In fact, what is truly eccentric is that many people, unfortunately, ignore the existence of such a relevant figure despite his obvious presence in our environment. For this reason, and on this occasion, I'll show you how this geometric figure allows us to solve the greatest mysteries of the universe. The official spatial model holds that we divide on the outside of a convex spheroid, and for such a statement, one of its supposed proofs is the Eratosthenes experiment. The truth is that this experiment has been carried out today by a multitude of people in different geographical coordinates and always gives a value approximate to 4,000 kilometers of circumference, which is consistent with the equatorial measurement of our world, which we can measure with boat movements, plane movements, and GPS. Therefore, this rules out the possibility of a flat Earth and shows that the Earth is indeed a spheroid of approximately 40,000 kilometers in circumference. However, what it does not demonstrate is that we live on the outside of said spheroid. I will gladly explain why. This image is a geometric representation of the cardioid caustic that occurs inside a concavity. It is composed of a multitude of straight lines that converge in a curved path of the light product of reflection on a concave surface. Well, if we use this geometric representation to trace the path of light. We verify that in this way, the rays of sunlight incident on the Earth's concave surface with the same angles that are verified in the Eratosthenes experiment itself. This is already tremendously important, since it not only gives a more natural response to Eratosthenes' experiment, but it also places us inhabiting the inner surface of a concave spheroid and consequently having established a natural trajectory for sunlight. It is important for them to know that this trajectory is also consistent with a multitude of natural phenomena, such as the preservation of the circular shapes of celestial bodies for most of the day, which is perfectly explained in this model thanks to the geometry and cardioid trajectory that the light follows which is characterized by not having discontinuities or angular points in its outline and by gently varying the curvature along the curve. These geometric characteristics allow that in 3D software such as Blender, following this path of light, we can see the celestial bodies preserving their circular shapes. Another natural phenomenon that is explained coherently with this path of light is the conservation of the angular sizes of celestial bodies without enlarging or shrinking due to perspective. In this model, and as happens with cardioid caustics produced inside a concavity, there is an aperture of the light that grows directly proportional to the curvature of its path. This explains why the angular sizes of celestial bodies remain constant even when observed from different locations within the Earth. Because it is the balance between the angular aperture and the curvature of the path of light, which explains that the perception of the light disks of celestial bodies would not do with the distance or angle of observation. Another phenomenon that is explained coherently with said trajectory is the parabolic proportion of solar radiation that occurs between dawn and midday. And the sunset? If we pay attention to the location of the Earth's concave surface that has the sun at the zenith, we will realize that at that time and place the density of light rays is maximum, and it is precisely this accumulation of light energy that produces a significant increase in the intensity of solar radiation, causing a peak of solar radiation at noon. On the other hand, 
if we move away from the zenith, the intensity of solar radiation gradually decreases. This occurs because sunlight rays begin to disperse because they follow a more curved path with more inclined angles and at a more distant actual distance from the sun which reduces the energy density in those areas of the Earth's concave surface. Now that you know that this trajectory of sunlight is consistent with experiential reality, I'll show you how. Based on this trajectory, we can also estimate the height and diameter of the moon and the sun. For this, it is essential to base ourselves on geometry and proportion, because this allows us to establish inherently stable, functional and efficient forms in the use of materials and energy. Because of this, in order to estimate the average height of the moon, it is important to know the point of intersection of a cardioid caustic occurring inside a concavity called the cusp, because it is. It is located at half the radius of its circumference when the caustic illuminates half of a concave circular or spherical surface. Therefore, considering that from the same point as the cusp occupies in this type of caustic, the moon is capable of illuminating 49.5% of the concave surface east of the Earth. It becomes an ideal location to position the moon in such a way that the cusp is located at half the radius of the Earth. That means that the average height of the moon should be approximately 3185.5 kilo kilometers above sea level. And if we also consider that the moon has an average angular size of 0.5 on tin O, we can already calculate its diameter, which is 28.4 km. Then, to estimate the height of the sun, it is important to know the concentration of rays near the cusp, called the central cusp segment. Said segment measures 1 to 4 of the radius formed from the cusp towards the center of the cardioid such that if we add the height of the cusp plus the length of the central cusp segment, a geometrically proportioned point results for positioning the sun. This is how the sun remains at an average height of approximately 3981.875 km above sea level. And if we know that the sun has an average angular size of 0 0.530, is that we can calculate and obtain its diameter which is 36.9 kilometers. Now you know that with the light path we are using, estimates of the height and diameter of the moon and the sun can be obtained based solely on geometry and proportion. However, to verify whether such estimates are functional in a predictive model, we must consider more factors such as the parallax between the sun and the moon. Thus, according to official data, the parallax that exists between the Sun and the Moon when observed simultaneously from two locations on Earth separated by 45O corresponds to a separation between both stars of 1.30 O which is equivalent to an angular separation of approximately two and a half moons and as you can see said angle of separation between the Sun and the Moon agrees perfectly with our estimates. Additionally, it is necessary to recheck the parallax with another different observation separation. So this time, I used a 90 degree separation of two locations on the ground. According to official data, this observation separation corresponds to a separation of both stars of 1.80, which is equivalent to approximately three and a half moons, which again corresponds to my model. In this way, we have verified that the estimates made are not only geometrically proportional but also completely functional in terms of the parallax between both celestial bodies. Another natural phenomenon that supports these estimates is the size of the shadow in solar eclipses. Because in this model, in a solar eclipse, the light rays that arrive from the outer edge of the moon to the perimeter of an average umbra of 270 kilometers in diameter do so at an angle of 89 degranos with respect to the Earth's surface, which is the expected angle according to the spherical proportion of the Eratosthenes experiment. As if that were not enough, when in this model we rotate the cardioid path of light 180O from the center of the universe 
we notice that a return of sunlight occurs at the antipode. This return of light explains the lunar eclipse without the need to resort to a third body as happens in the official model. And above all, by making the corresponding intercalation of the remaining light area, we complete the trajectory of the sunlight, being able to explain with it all the lunar phases, which in turn agree with the shadows that we see on the Earth. Given what is exposed, one of the most important differences with respect to the official model is that in this concave Earth model, the Sun is only 29.9% larger than the Moon and not 399979% larger as in the official model. This disproportion of scales makes the official spatial model unrepresentative and impractical for describing how phenomena actually occur in the natural world. In fact, observable natural phenomena usually operate with reasonable proportions between causes and effects. In this case, the totally disproportionate scales of the official model are inconsistent with what physics seeks to represent phenomena clearly and in line with observable reality. Another crucial difference is that in any concave Earth model, all solar radiation is emitted from inside the Earth's concave spheroid. And in this way, a value close to 100% of solar radiation is taken advantage of to fulfill the natural purpose of promoting the development of life. However, in the official model, the sun needs to waste 99.99995% of its radiation to outer space. Therefore, nearly 0.00 or 0.53% of its radiation is absorbed by the Earth. Thus, the official model poorly manages universal physical principles, including the law of conservation of energy, the inverse square law of distance, and the second law of thermodynamics. The principle of energy efficiency, the law of black body radiation, the law of conservation of the moment of light, and the principle of minimization of action. In other words, the official spatial model does not correctly represent reality because the natural physical world tends to operate more efficiently. In conclusion, the cardioid trajectory is a fundamental key to understanding the natural world around us because it provides us with coherent solutions for many natural phenomena in our world. It also allows us to build a concave Earth model with precise measurements that far exceed the official model in fundamental aspects such as balance, proportion, and efficiency. It should be noted that achieving this is completely impossible to perform in any flat earth model. Therefore, not only can we affirm that Eratosthenes' experiment does not demonstrate that we live on the outside of a spheroid, but we can also affirm that said experiment demonstrates greater coherence in this concave earth model. Because if it's about which is the most perfect model, a concave spheroid is the shape of the earth most likely to be the true one.